I've never seen a really fruitful conversation about free will versus OSAS or Calvinism versus Arminianism. But today I'm going to dig into it a little bit, and uh, you're gonna we're going to take a good look at both sides. You know, in one podcast, you know, I'm going to pack a lot in here. You're also going to hear my opinions. <laughs> and uh, anyway, just buckle up. You're having coffee with Conrad on. Conrad rocks. Welcome, welcome, welcome to yet another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad from ConradRocks.net. Rocks of revelation being poured out to you. And you know my passion is for you. Yes, you, the listener to the Coffee with Conrad podcast at ConradRocks.net. I want you to have a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. Now, today we're going to be talking about Arminianism versus Calvinism. And it doesn't seem like a spiritual thing, but I'm going to apply a spiritual perspective uh, to this throughout. We're going to dig in a little bit on both sides. I mean, you can't, people spend years studying this stuff, so you're only going to get a a cursory, you know, crash course on TULIP. And I've studied Calvinism and Arminianism, not extensively, but enough to get a basic understanding And I know that some of you that are listening to this podcast will probably think I'm an idiot. You have much more experience than I do on this topic. So I'm humble here. I'm just telling you I don't know everything. But I want you to understand, from my podcast, my perspective is always based on having a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. And that's where I'm going to be coming from today as well. This, to me, is more important than deciding whether Calvinism or Arminianism is correct. But in this podcast, I'm going to explore a little bit of both views, uh, their main points and differences, and give you an idea of what what it's all about, and then you're going to learn my perspective. I'm also going to be talking about some listener comments towards the end. We are happy coffee with Conrad! Okay, so the one saved, always saved debate is a distraction, in my opinion, kind of like eschatology. I I dug into eschatology when I first got saved, and it took me a while to realize that I was actually fighting the spirit of truth. I was getting all caught up into it, and then I'm like, hey, wait, this is distracting me from my call. But here we go. Calvinism, it's a theological system that emphasizes the sovereignty of God and the predestination of souls. It's named after John Calvin. He was a 16th century French theologian. Now, just remember TULIP. The five points of Calvinism are TULIP. One, total depravity. Humans are born in a state of sin and are incapable of saving themselves. Two, unconditional election. That's the you. God chooses some people to be saved while others are not. Three, would be the L, limited atonement. Jesus Christ died only for the elect, not for all people. Four, which would be the I, irresistible grace. The elect cannot resist the grace of God and will be saved. Five, perseverance of the saints, or OSAS. The elect will persevere in their faith and will never be lost. Now, Arminianism is a theological system that emphasizes free will of humans and the possibility of salvation for all people. It's named after Jacob Arminius. The five points of Arminianism are, and it's kind of like Tulip, okay, because he was a student of John Calvin, but it's Tulip. (laughs) You'll see what I'm talking about. Total depravity. Humans are born in a state of sin, but they're not totally depraved they still have some capacity for good. Two, on the unconditional election, God does not choose people to be saved based on their foreseen faith or good works. He chooses them based on his own mercy. Three, on limited atonement, Jesus Christ died for all people, not just the elect. Four, 
resistible grace, as opposed to irresistible grace, humans can resist the grace of God and choose not to be saved. Five, perseverance of the saints, or OSAS. The saints can fall away from their faith and lose their salvation. Okay, so now let's contrast the differences between Calvinism and Arminianism. The main difference between Calvinism and Arminianism is the role of human free will in salvation. That is the crux of the matter. Calvinists believe that salvation is entirely, entirely a work of God, while Arminians believe that humans have some role to play in their own salvation. Some other differences would include the nature of God's sovereignty. Calvinists believe that God is sovereign over all things, including salvation, while Arminians believe that God's sovereignty is limited by human free will. The nature of sin. Now, Calvinists believe that humans are totally depraved and incapable of saving themselves, while Arminians believe that humans are not totally depraved and have some capacity for good. The nature of atonement, Calvinists believe that Jesus Christ died only for the elect, while Arminians believe that Jesus Christ died for all people. The nature of grace, Calvinists believe that grace is irresistible, that the elect cannot resist the grace of God, while Arminians believe that grace is resistible and that humans can choose to reject the grace of God. The nature of perseverance, OSAS, Calvinists believe that the saints will persevere in their faith and will never be lost while Arminians believe that the saints can fall away and lose their faith. So who was John Calvin? John Calvin was a French theologian, a big, big prominent guy in the Protestant Reformation, and he was an ecclesiastical statesman who lived in the 1500s. He was the most important figure in the second generation of the Protestant Reformation, and he was the successor of Martin Luther. He wrote The Institutes of the Christian Religion, an influential work of Protestant theology that synthesized the views of different Protestant sects. He also established the institutional and social patterns of Geneva, which influenced Protestantism elsewhere in Europe and North America. He died in Geneva, Switzerland in 1564. Now, who was Jacobus Arminius? Jacobus Arminius was a Dutch Reformed theologian and a minister who lived in the 1500s. He was born in October of 1560, and he died in October of 1609. Arminius's views became the basis of Arminianism and the Dutch Remonstrant movement. He was originally a student of John Calvin before changing his beliefs including his understanding of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. So he was a student of Calvin and then came about with Arminianism. Hi, this is Jennifer Cotney with Christian Mix 106, and I'm having coffee with Conrad on conradrocks.net. Okay, so so far I've gave you the basic concepts of what Calvinism and Arminianism believe, and I talk a little bit about how they differed. Now, what passages do they use? Now, a lot of them have a lot of scriptures that they use. That's somewhat going to be part of my point towards the end of this podcast. So let's talk about a few scriptures. If I mentioned them all, you're gonna, it, it would just be too long of a podcast. Uh, but this is to whet your appetite to do your own personal study. On depravity, Calvinism believes in total depravity. Arminianism believes in partial depravity. And the Calvinists might use... Romans 3, 10 through 12, as, is, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, and they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Okay, so that's one of their texts that they use for total depravity. And for partial depravity, Arminians may use John 1, 9. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So Calvinism and Arminianism have different perspectives, and they use different scriptures to support their belief. 
Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey by Conrad is a must-read for those aspiring to be in the prophetic ministry or those looking to learn more about the supernatural spiritual aspect of Christianity. This book gives an intimate look at the author's experiences with astral projection, telekinesis, poltergeist, precognition, and demonic encounters before he was born again. Conrad also shares his supernatural prophetic experiences after being born again and shows you what it is like to be born again to see the kingdom of God. With plenty of scripture references and personal testimonies, this book is sure to give you the boost of confidence you need to jump into the supernatural aspect of Christianity. Get your copy of Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey today. So now let's talk about election, the U for unconditional election. Calvinism believes in unconditional election, and Arminianism believes in conditional election. For unconditional election, Calvinists may use Ephesians 1, 4 through 5 as part of their proof text. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Very powerful argument, very powerful support text for Calvinism. For conditional election, the Armenians may use 1 Peter 1, 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace multiplied. Now let's talk about atonement, which would be limited atonement, the Ellen Tulip. Calvinism believes in limited atonement, where the Arminians believes in unlimited atonement. For limited atonement, the Calvinists may use John 10, 11. I'm the good shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Okay. For unlimited atonement, Arminians may use 1 John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see how those contrast a little bit, but they're both in the same Bible written by the same Spirit of God. The concept of atonement refers to the reconciliation between God and the believer in humanity through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Calvinism and Arminianism, they hold opposing views or different views regarding to this, and Calvinism basically teaches limited atonement also known as particular redemption. Uh, according to this view, Jesus' death on the cross was specifically intended for the salvation of the elect, okay? Those whom God hath chosen for salvation. And they have a lot of scriptures for this. Uh, Calvinists believe that Jesus' sacrifice was not universal, but targeted only for the benefit of those whom that God has predestined. So they often reference John 10, 11, uh, where Jesus refers to himself as a good shepherd and gives his life for the sheep, signifying his sacrificial death, his sacrificial death for the chosen ones. Now, Arminianism, uh, they espouse unlimited atonement. They believe that Jesus' death on the cross was for the sins of all humanity. Okay, and they got scriptures too. Okay, that offer the offer of salvation was extended to everyone, right? However, the efficacy of this atonement is realized only when individuals respond to God's grace by exercising faith in Jesus Christ. That would be their free will. And they point to 1 John 2 2, which states that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, not only for believers but also for the sins of the whole world, uh, suggesting a universal scope for the atonement of Christ. So, you know, you have to respond. That's their whole idea. You are having coffee with Conrad on conradrocks.net. Okay, now we're going to be talking about grace, which would be the I for irresistible grace. Calvinism believes in irresistible grace, where Arminianism believes in resistible grace. For resistible grace... Armenians may use Acts 7.51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. For irresistible grace, Calvinists may use John 6.37. 
all that the Father given me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So you see the dueling scriptures from the same God, from the same Bible? That's what I find fascinating about this, this study here. Now we have the perseverance of the saints, the P in TULIP. Calvinism believes O-S-A-S, the perseverance of the saints, where a person elected by God will persevere in faith and will not permanently deny or turn away from Christ. Arminianism believes in conditional salvation, where a believer can, of their own free will, turn away from Christ and lose salvation. So, for per- perseverance of the saints, let's talk about a scripture the Calvinists can use, which would be Philippians 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Now, Perseverance of the Saints, also known as Eternal Security, or OSAS, Once Saved, Always Saved, it's got a hashtag, pertains to the belief about the enduring nature of salvation in the faith of believers. So Calvinists assert that those whom God has elected and saved will persevere in their faith until the end. According to this view, once a person is genuinely saved, they cannot permanently lose their salvation. So Arminians, they use the passage, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, that scary passage, to refute the doctrine of the perseverance of saints. In this passage, the author of Hebrews warns against falling away apostasy from the faith and suggests that it's possible for believers to reject Jesus and lose their salvation. Here's the passage. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance, seeing that they crucify themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. So this warns against apostasy, uh, suggesting that it's possible for a person who has accepted Christ and experiences grace to turn away from him and experience negative consequences for sure. So now it's time for listener comments, and I've got some really good ones. I did this Facebook post. Basically, it's not, you know, I'm not trying to be con confrontational, controversial, but it's what do you think about Calvinism versus Arminianism or OSAS or free will versus God's sovereignty? What are some of your thoughts? And that's, I'm going to include the link to this Facebook post. If you want to jump in, it's a public post. And here's some of your comments. Greg Brockman says a true student of God's word should be capable of defending both sides of this debate. Now, I think that speaks volumes, volumes right there. It gives a clue that there's no resolution to this debate, okay? And I believe a finite mind may have a hard time comprehending an infinite God who is outside of time. Amen. But that's a good uh, comment. There's two sides, and someone that studies their Bible should be able to defend both sides. Alexandria Butler has a really good comment, and she says this, I feel a lot of these conversations are rooted in intellectualism and not the Holy Spirit. If you bring it up, I know you're anointed, so God will be lifted up, but with others, it is a very dry thing. Thank you, Alexandria. That's a great compliment, actually. And yes, I agree with you. These debates are rooted in carnal intellectualism, And this is going to bring me to one of my favorite passages in 1 Corinthians. And my speech and preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yeah, that fits the Conrad Rocks Coffee with Conrad podcast perfectly. That's what I'm about. Not wisdom of men, but the spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus, the power of God. Now, Libby Tomlin makes an interesting observation. The problem is people who are arguing either side 
are missing the whole point of the gospel. Proverbs 3, 5, John 5, 39 and 40. It's one thing to give your thoughts and insights, but it's a whole other beast to insist that your thoughts and insights are the end of the whole matter. Humility versus arrogance. Yes, Libby, this is one of the things that I've noticed. When you get into these debates, OSAS, it never resolves. And each, each side tends to dig in their heels with their pet scriptures, and they're ignoring the whole big point of salvation, right? It's basically a distraction from our call. The distraction from the, it's a great distraction from the Great Commission. Amanda Fuller, she had a comment here, and I thought, hmm, how am I going to respond to that? But after I thought about it, I'm like going, yeah, you know, this is right on. She says, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you talk to him daily? And that is the crux of my point. My passion is for you to have a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. And I believe the point she's making here is we're getting off on this intellectual rants, and we're just leaving God behind. (laughs) Do you have a spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ, which is much more important than are you a Calvinist or not? Gail Russell comes up with a good comment, which I tend to gravitate towards. I can see the wisdom in it. Here it is. Over decades of having these discussions, I've come to see both sides in both these arguments. Free will versus predestination. Once saved, always saved. In each, some level of both sides of the debate are valid. My question would be, can both positions be true? Okay, that's pretty cool. For example, Can I choose life myself, or have I been predestined by God's choice? My view, many are called, but few are chosen. We are drawn by the Father, wooed by the Spirit. He is called, invited us all, but not all choose to accept and come. Now, God being God in his timelessness, he sees how each will respond and elects those who will choose him. Amen. OSAS, yes, he's able to secure us for eternity, and nothing can remove us from him, his hand, but... We can jump, leave, remove ourselves, fall away. So so each side of each debate can be at least partly true. All right, I'm going to offer kind of an interesting insight here because like I said earlier, a finite carnal mind cannot comprehend a spiritual infinite God, a God that created time and matter and space, right? How can we comprehend him? And we see these scriptures that seem to support both sides. And she's saying, well, maybe both are true. Okay, so... I'd like to think, I think it was Einstein that proposed a model of infinite futures, infinite timelines. You know, God created time, he's outside of time, and he is infinite in his knowledge. He can know each and every timeline that's possible, right? So somehow or another, both could be true. I'm, I'm willing to put that on the table. Are you? You know, and Pam Thompson, she says something that t- touches on this. Um, she says, I'm simple, not as well versed in the scriptures as I should be. I personally believe our relationship with God is personal and different for each of us. We all guard against certain things that we realize we need to work on. Then she goes on to say here, I'm going to say something I should keep to myself. This group is not inclusive. There are people here that actually drive others away. Their moral superiority does exactly the opposite of what I think God wants us to do. There are a lot of verses that talk about seeing oneself above or doing better than others and God's disfavor of those individuals. And she's saying it's not about my question. So this is important because people that have these debates, that you get a sense that they have intellectual superiority and you're just, yo, you down here, you're just too stupid to understand Calvinism. You're just, you just don't get it. And I get that. We come off as jerks. We often come off as jerks. So if we're going to have this conversation, let's have it with humility and respect. Amen? Good point, Pam. And Vernon Mordecai always has something good to comment. He says, I agree, Conrad. I've spent years attempting to base doctrine by God's word, not man. The sad thing, they usually think they're right and everyone else is wrong. And he goes on in his comment here, but this is the point I wanted to address. The sad thing is they usually think they're right and everyone else is wrong. This is the sense. Having had this debate and been involved in this debate for decades, I know that it doesn't resolve. And people tend to dig in their heels on their pet scriptures and they ignore the pet scriptures of the other side. We're not having a fruitful dialogue. I like it where he says, I'm going to base doctrine on God's word, 
not man. And guess what these doctrines are named after? Men, Calvin and Arminian. Oh no, I overslept. I missed coffee with Conrad. That's the best Christian podcast ever. He always has inspiring stories, practical tips, and biblical insights that make my day better and my faith stronger. What did he talk about today? I need to know. Wait, I can still catch up on his website or on any podcast app. I just need to search for Coffee with Conrad podcast and subscribe. There, I did it. Now I can listen to Coffee with Conrad anytime, anywhere. All right, now I'm going to talk about some of my thoughts. Should not the God of all the earth do right? You know, I I have a hard time grasping the concept that God would send robots to hell. I mean, robots don't have any free will. They didn't, I mean, if they have no free will, then how can they do anything wrong? They're predestined to do all these wrong things and then suffer torment. I just, I can't get my head around that, right? I just, it's something that I I struggle with. Another problem that I have with Calvinism is that it seems to absolve people from the responsibility to do the Great Commission. Basically, the idea you get when when Calvinism starts taking over is I don't have to do anything. It's all predestined. Okay, so that desire, which is Latin for of the Father, which motivates you with passion to do things, well, you don't have to do anything. In Calvinism. I mean that that's what I hear from it. That might not be what they're saying, but it absolves them from their responsibility to preach the gospel. I hope I articulated that right, because you know, you, you might as well just stay in bed. It's all predestined. That's one of my problems with Calvinism. Another problem I have with Calvinism is there's too many if thens. If then means you're going to be making a choice. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear. You know, there's too many if thens. The Bible has so many if thens in the Bible that we've got to have a choice. Another problem I have with Calvinism is how can we truly love God if we have no free will? Can a robot love somebody? And, and love. When you love somebody, how do you know that somebody loves you? When they go out of their way, when they go through uncomfortable circumstances to make sure that you're okay, they care about you and they show voluntarily, right? They're not a robot. They voluntarily come up uh, and help you in whatever area you need help in. And they, you know, they make sure you're good. Another thought I have, and I've mentioned it kind of, is you'll notice that both sides They dig in their heels with their own pet scriptures, and they discount the opposition. It's like they will not have a fruitful conversation. My belief is that you cannot just ignore the scriptures that you don't like. You must deal with them because they're part of God's Word. You can't just throw it out and pick the ones that you like. So I have a problem with this whole thing because they're seemingly... Uh, dueling scriptures. <laughs> okay. So like I said earlier, there's a, I got a finite mind. I cannot understand a spiritual infinite God who created time and space. You know, and I want to talk about Esther a little bit. Mordecai says something interesting here to Esther in 414. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, Then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So Mordecai is espousing some biblical wisdom here that Israel, it's the will of God, okay, God's will, his sovereign will, is that Israel will be saved, and it's going to be saved. That's the point. If Esther rises up, maybe it'll be saved through her, right? But if Esther doesn't rise up, it's going to be saved anyway. So think about that. This may not be the strongest argument that I can make here, but one of the things that that leaps out at me is, does the Bible really say for us to call ourselves by individuals' names or denominations? Think about it. 
The Bible warns against dividing ourselves based on human leaders or identifying solely with specific individuals. In, in 1 Corinthians 1, 12, and 13, the Apostle Paul addresses the issue of divisions within the church at Corinth. Uh, some were aligning themselves with different leaders. There was division there. He says, now this, I say that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So Paul's point in this passage is to emphasize the unity, you know, Jesus' prayer, I pray that we all be one in John 17, the unity of the body of Christ, and to discourage divisions based on personal allegiances to specific leaders. The focus should be on Jesus, not human figures. So this principle can be applied to these various theological positions as well. So in conclusion here, I want to just say that we really need to keep our eyes on the ball. I got distracted by eschatology like for years, and the whole time, the whole time I was studying eschatology, the Spirit of God was tugging on me to stop. And, and, and every time I would read something in a book, a theological book or a popular book or Left Behind or whatever, the Spirit would say, that's not right, that's something, that's not right. And then I started going back to just reading the Bible for myself. And uh, these Arminianism, Calvinism doctrines, these are good around the kitchen table. They're probably good in forums, but, you know, where you're having a healthy discussion and you're not just trying to pound somebody with what you believe. There is too many, you know, dueling scriptures here for me to take a stance on it. I believe my finite mind cannot comprehend an infinite God. I'm going to leave it up to God. And right now, my will is to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I choose to do so. Amen. So be sure to check out the links in the show notes. I'm going to have a link to that Facebook post if you want to jump in on the discussion with humility and fear. Amen. Hopefully this has touched you. If this has touched you, please share this with your friends and family on Facebook, social media, and uh, like and comment. God bless you. I want to thank you for being in my life. Till we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comradrocks.net.